think you're wrong. <laughs> Silver will work. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome. It's 4 p.m. and there is a quorum present, so at this time I'll call the City Council's strategic planning meeting of March the 8th, 2022 to order. At this time I'll recognize Interim City Manager Brian Bourne. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight is the uh, final round oh, of... Uh, we'll take care of that. <laughs> did, did you miss something? Uh, I need to make a correction. It's 4.30, not 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> Old habits die hard. The, 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 the note for council says four, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, tonight is our final round of departmental budget presentations. Uh, after this, I think the next meeting will be on the 19th to uh, be presented with the, the budget. Um, so, for now, we'll have uh, Rob Miller, Interim Director for Energy Services, start the presentations. Right. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you guys. I've got a lot to get through today, so we're going to dive right in. Uh, we're going to start with, uh, these are the major initiatives for both the Electric Division and the Natural Gas Division. We're going to start with the Electric Division here. All right, our, our first major initiative is uh, subdivision construction. This is gonna be a capital project. Uh, we currently anticipate uh, 1,125 new homes within fiscal year 23, and an additional uh, 1,299 homes in fiscal year 24. Our funding level is $1 million for fiscal year 23, and the same will recur for uh, fiscal year 24. Uh, this covers the electric cables, the transformers, street lights, et cetera. And then we have several uh, personnel additions that are associated with this growth as well. Next slide we have here is just an overview of our electric system that reinforces that growth. We wanted to give you guys a, a good idea of where we're seeing the growth in our system. And as you see, it's, it's throughout. Um, if you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me at a, at a different time. Um, I'm just going to try to continue through this. Our next initiative is electric substation modernization. Our existing electric substations have electromechanical relays that need to be updated to electronic relays. The new re relays are more cost effective, more reliable, and provide better system protection. Uh, the replacement is done systematically over several fiscal years. Uh, estimated cost for fiscal year 23 is $160,000. And then uh, we'll have a recurring cost of another $160,000 in fiscal year 24. Uh, the electromechanical relays, uh, we, we struggle to get spare parts. Uh, manufacturers are making these obsolete to where we're having to, new to move to the newer technology. Next initiative here is uh, Hal Cohen substation improvements. Um, we have several circuit breakers at Hal Cohen that are obsolete. The manufacturers are no longer making replacement parts. Uh, we have enough to currently maintain, but we need to get those replaced as soon as we can. Replacing these breakers with breakers that are standard to other electric substations will make maintenance and repairs more cost effective. We're able to then stock two or three breakers to be able to replace all the breakers and all of our substations versus as we built things, we had different manufacturers and different substations. So it allows us to be more efficient. Additionally, oil containment uh, was not required when the substation was built. Adding oil containment will provide environmental protection and safeguard against potential liability. Failure to add this, uh, it's right next to Bearskin Creek could result in a large environmental cleanup and uh, cost the city significant money and also liability. Wrong. That, 
Yes, sir. So I believe you just answered that question. How many substations are there? We currently have seven online, and there is an eighth that is sitting there waiting to be energized for a new industrial facility. Okay. Yep. Uh, the estimated cost for fiscal year 23 is 390000 and then fiscal year you'll see a recurring uh, budget of 390000 there. We plan to budget this one um, through fiscal year 27, and then we'll systematically work through the system. Next, uh, next initiative is the energy services uh, additional facilities. We purchased the 11 acres neighboring our uh, property at 2201 Walkup Avenue. The physical address is 2109 Walkup Avenue for the neighboring parcel. Um, the energy services building no longer meets the needs of the department and a new building is needed to supplement the existing facility. The new building will include space for a larger warehouse, offices for purchasing, warehouse employees, electric and gas training rooms, a conference room that's large enough to host the entire uh, department, transformer storage and disposal area, and there's also a possibility that IT will occupy some space as well. The estimated cost is uh, $1,250,000 $1, out of the electric fund, and you'll also see a matching, um, matching estimated fund in the gas division as well that matches this same amount. The recurring cost will be $75,000 for utilities and maintenance to the facility. That's on the same site you're currently on. You got plenty of space there. It's it's actually across Richardson Street. We um, when Mr. Mitchell was here back in 2018, we purchased the neighboring parcel that's 11 acres, yeah. and that backs up all the way to Steel Street and Jones Street and the the neighborhoods over there. I, I just got one more question. This yes, sir. Kind of nitpicky. Uh, if you could regress a minute, sure. those uh, new homes that you got the plan for coming on in 23 and 24, is that based on permitting? How, how do you come up with those numbers? So we, we do a forecasting. What we've seen is most developments can't build more than 50 homes in a year unless they have multiple builders. Uh, so we've taken what's been approved and then we put that in a spreadsheet and estimated they'll build about 50, sometimes 60 homes per year. And then we've added those up per <coughs> fiscal year based on what's approved on our electric uh, electric system and then also on our natural gas system. Okay, how about the economic conditions? If those deteriorate, uh, what, what, what's your thought there? Um, several of these have already started. So uh, if the economic conditions deteriorate, we also have several large industrials coming on as well. So um, we are putting in as the phases are available for construction, we're not going well ahead. So we're not um, spending money irresponsibly. So we're building I, out as- I wasn't accusing you of that, no, but, no, I, but I, I'm a skin plant. I don't like to spend money, correct. especially when it's taxpayer money. And I'm just curious. Yep. So we work with the developers hand in hand to get what their phases are. We have a confidence level going in that they're going to build out and we don't get very far in front of them. We try not to at least. That's fine. Okay. Next is uh, personnel needed for the electric division. Uh, we need two administrative assistants. Uh, these will provide uh, clerical and administrative functions for the energy services department, both the electric and natural gas divisions. Additional staff is needed to ensure compliance with federal, state, local requirements and to keep up with the increased workload as we increase the number of customers served by the electric and natural gas utilities. The estimated cost for fiscal year 23 is 158368 and uh, the reoccurring cost is $152,368. Next is uh, two additional engineering technicians. The engineers uh, design electric and natural gas mains, feeders, services uh, for commercial, industrial, and residential customers. They also handle the record keeping and the GIS mapping. Current staffing levels are not adequate to maintain the existing workload 
Uh, additional staff will be needed for the workload. Currently, we've got an estimated 8,518 new gas customers over the next five years and 5,518 electric customers. The estimated cost in fiscal year 23 is $198,059, and then the reoccurring cost is $187,060. Next is an electric safety and training coordinator. Uh, this position will be responsible to schedule, coordinate, and provide training for electric employees to comply with all federal, state, and local requirements. This is one of the issues that's been affected through the current workload. Um, it's made it impossible to coordinate and train employees successfully. We really struggle. Uh, our crew leaders are being spread very thin. This responsibility was on them. If we had one person dedicated to this, um, it will ensure that the employees are receiving required annual training. Uh, the annual, annual recurring training is required to provide employees with the skills they need to perform their jobs safely. The position will allow training of multiple employees from different crews without the stoppage of production, and that's the key. We'll be able to go get one person, pull off of this crew, maintain the production that we need to to do the required maintenance and the construction for these new customers and also get the training that our employees need. Estimated cost is $176,817 and the recurring annual salary benefits are $122,017. You'll notice a $50,000 vehicle in with this uh, employee as well. Next are uh, three journeyman lineman positions. Uh, they perform uh, skilled technical services, installing, maintaining, and repairing the electric distribution system. Additional staffing is needed to uh, maintain the current increased demand for service with the addition of 5,518 residential customers over the next five years. Uh, this also offsets additional uh, contractor costs that would be, we would save $3.2 million over five years if we had to go get contract crews to do the same work that these crews would do. So uh, the estimated cost is $714,104. And you'll notice in there a $350,000 bucket truck. And then the recurring cost is $342,624. Again, that's three positions. Finding people like this uh, any easier? Um, we are competitively, um, we do a good job competitively getting uh, qualified and skilled applicants with experience on the electric side. So uh, with the, the pay, the current pay structure, we're doing, doing a good job. Right. We're having multiple candidates each time. It's not just picking from <clears throat> inexperienced folks. Great. Yep. Do we ever get anybody from, uh, say, Union Power that wants to leave there and come here, or vice versa? We've lost several to Union Power throughout the years. Um, I would say we definitely, we have one now that's in engineering that came over years ago from Union Power, but normally they're, we're not gaining workforce from them. Most of our workforce is gained from contract crews in which we offer a stable environment in which they're close to home versus having to do a lot of travel. So that's, that's where we see a lot of our, our workforce come from. And, and that's, that's one of the advantages that the city offers is the stability. But we don't see a lot from the neighboring co-ops, no sir. In regards to training, I just have a question. Are you now having to pull stop production in order to meet your training requirements? We are, or it's getting deferred until later. Okay. We're, we're doing minimal training at the point to meet the requirements. Additional training can be done and is useful. We're just having to maintain the production. Okay. Thank you, six and 20. Um, two linemen apprentice positions. Um, again, they, they perform skilled work uh, in construction, maintenance, and repair of electric distribution system. Uh, additional staff needed to maintain the residential growth and industrial growth over the next few years. 
and this is also part of the savings if we had to hire contract crews. The estimated is uh, $603,454 for fiscal year 23, and that also includes a $400,000 digger derrick. And then the total recurring annual salary is $188,384. Here's a summary. Um, total 10 positions requested. Total initial cost is $1,850,802. Uh, annual recurring is $992,453. And uh, our current staff, we're, we're struggling to, to keep up with the demand for service and also do the maintenance required on the systems in addition to the employee training. Uh, what you'll see here is a table that shows the new annual revenue and what we'd like to suggest is that the annual revenue will cover the expenses of the personnel that are needed. So uh, the annual revenue is um, mostly industrial on the electric side and then it's about 50-50 in year one and then what, years later, 24, 25, 26, 27 is more... Uh, the residential dives down in the electric and the industrial maintains. So you'll see here there's a difference of 2.4 million in fiscal year 23, and then that continues to grow 3.9 in fiscal year 24, 4.3 in fiscal year 25, up into the 5 million in fiscal year 26 and 27. If all our departments were like that, we'd be in good shape. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Prime, before you go to natural gas, please. Yes, ma'am. Go back to um, the third slide. Sure. Can you give me the um, itemized um, detail of what the cost is for personnel versus the material? Because you've got a one lump sum of one million. So this does not include any personnel here in the one million dollars. That is just for the construction. This is a capital project that is for materials. So the uh, personnel costs are not included here. They're on the individual slides for the personnel. So is this is for electric cables, transformers, and street lights? And yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, we'll go on to the natural gas division. Uh, it's very similar, uh, similar challenges. Um, First initiative is new subdivision construction. Currently, we've got uh, 1,184 new homes in the gas service territory scheduled for construction in fiscal year 23, and then 2,195 planned in fiscal year 24. Uh, the estimated cost is a million dollars. This is for natural gas mains and services, gas meters, et cetera. This is for the materials in the, the construction. Uh, total cost for um, recurring is $1.5 million. So as those numbers go up, uh, you'll see the, as the customer demand goes up, you'll see the funding go up for this initiative. And here, uh, the biggest thing to, to show you with this map is this not only includes the subdivisions in the city, this also includes subdivisions outside of the city as well. So we've got over 3,000 customers outside of the city that are currently planned. And uh, that's in addition to, to what you guys have approved. So um, the other thing here, please notice, um, just for those that aren't aware, we serve well up into Unionville. We serve all the way through Wingate and Marshville to the Anson County line. And then we're all the way over to Mineral Springs. So I did want to make you aware of, of the communities that we serve in addition to our community. Uh, I know this is about budget, but it's a question that's always on our mind when Rusk makes a presentation. What percentage are we, uh, as far as gas capacity, uh, say on a cold winter day when furnaces are running and heat's being pumped? What so, percentage are we uh, right now? So for our transmission line, which is the transmission line that transverses three counties, we're less than 50%. Um, that that was built with a lot of foresight for the next 50 years, and that was constructed in 2009, 2010. So we, we have good supply. You'll see some restraints throughout the system, and we'll talk about that in a couple of the initiatives. 
but those are restraints that we can overcome on a, on a micro level versus a macro level. In the big scheme of things, we're in very good shape to serve all these customers. Uh, the next initiative you'll see is gas system reinforcements, uh, natural gas pipeline projects to improve mm -hmm. natural gas delivery and redundancy, resolve weaknesses in the distribution system related to system pressures and capacity, and improve peak demand functionality. Uh, estimated cost is 750000 for fiscal year 23. And fiscal year 24, you'll see that go down to 300000 this is a reoccurring project that we uh, have typically funded since 2012. This allows us to address smaller issues within the distribution system and get more pressure to certain areas. Uh, next is a gas system uprate project. This improves natural gas delivery to industrial areas with increased demand for service in cold weather situations. Specifically, we're going to take high pressure further down Rocky River Road. That's going to help us strengthen the Mineral Springs area and also back towards downtown. Uh, this is funded at $125,000 for fiscal year 23, and there's an additional fiscal year 24 funding of $125,000. Next uh, initiative is the industrial park funding. Uh, materials and labor to install natural gas infrastructures and new industrial parks to serve <clears throat> new customers. Estimated fiscal year 23 funding, 125,000. Uh, recurring fiscal year 24 funding is uh, $100,000. There's uh, currently some plans for city and county industrial parks, and we just need to make sure that we have the uh, funding to provide infrastructure throughout those. Uh, here you'll see the additional energy services facility funding out of the gas division. I won't run through all this again. It's uh, 1250000 similar to what the electric is putting together. We feel like we can build out that facility by the end of uh, calendar year 23. Next is uh, personnel. Natural gas superintendent uh, provide uh, technical service and construction, maintenance, and repair of natural gas system and provide field supervision and direction. Uh, the positions needed to fill the gap between the gas system manager responsibilities and the gas crew leaders. The gas system manager's duties do not allow him adequate time to handle the field supervision instruction over the crews. Adding this position will allow the proper oversight of crew leaders as well as provide qualified gas supervisor to ensure compliance with the federal requirements. Uh, estimated cost is $252,657. Please note that includes an $85,000 vehicle and the recurring cost is $141,517. Rob, Rob, you already have elevations site plans for the new electric and gas service facility building? No, sir, we don't. Um, what we've done is this is our introduction to you guys with the concept. I plan to take another presentation to General Services next month, and then after that we plan to put out an RFP for an architect. So uh, we want to make sure to run through the proper channels and not, um, not assume that this is a done deal. Uh, we do have an existing capital fund that has some initial funding that we funded back in fiscal year 21 that is uh, sitting out there. We have done surveying of the site, so we're familiar where BMP and some of those things do need to be cited, but that's all we've done to this point. Yep. Uh, next personnel item on natural gas is the natural gas safety and training coordinator. Uh, schedule, coordinate, and provide training for gas employees to comply with all federal, state, and local requirements. This is similar to the electric uh, initiative as well. It allow us to um, maintain the current workload and production and train employees successfully. There's another layer on the gas side. There's a federal requirement that has an intense training program that you have to check all the boxes every year for each employee for them to do specific tasks. So this, um, we've been doing that, but we've been sacrificing production or maintenance of our system to do that. So we don't have a choice. 
Um, position will allow training of multiple employees from different crews and just give us more efficiency in getting this complete. Estimated cost is $176,586, includes a $50,000 vehicle, and the recurring cost is $113,697. Next, we have uh, Energy Services Locator. Uh, locate underground electric, gas, and fiber optic lines to prevent accidental damage. Current staff cannot keep up with the uh, demand the annual locates uh, due to the customers, the construction activity, and this is gonna continue to increase as these subdivisions, industrial sites, DOT projects, and fiber to home projects come through our area. So, um, the energy services utility locators, uh, we locate all of, all of our own utilities, electric, gas, um, fiber optic. This also includes the 43 mile transmission line all the way to Iredell County. And uh, we, our main issue is to prevent outside party damage. That's the number one risk to our facilities is somebody else hitting us. And we've seen it quite free, frequently. Um, additionally, our locators serve as on-site inspectors for all construction activities within close proximity to high-pressure gas lines. Estimated cost is $144,565, uh, includes a $45,000 vehicle, and then total recurring annual salary is $86,225. Next is uh, four gas technicians. Um, they provide uh, construction, maintenance, and repair of natural gas system. Our current staff is overloaded and we can't keep up with the demand for new service and the maintenance uh, requirements along with the training requirements. The addition of 8,518 gas customers over the next five years is just gonna increase this and multiply it. Additional staffing is needed to maintain adequate level of service the increased customer base will provide increased revenues that will offset the cost. In addition, if we don't get the personnel, we'd have the potential of having to hire a contractor at significantly higher costs as well. So the estimated cost is 435352 This includes one vehicle at $45,000. And then the total recurring annual salary benefits cost is $377,012. So in summary, there's uh, seven positions requested on the natural gas side. The total initial cost is $1,009,160. Total recurring cost is $718,450. And again, we're just struggling with keeping up with the demand for service, the maintenance on the system, also the tr training requirements. There's an additional compliance requirement due to the federal requirements on the natural gas side that requires a lot of paperwork, a lot of documentation about everything we do. So you'll see the new annual revenue estimates, so 1.9 million, 2.3, 1.6, 1.4. Um, the personnel expenses are initially 1 million and then drop down to 700,000. And you can see there's a difference. So personnel requests will be covered by the additional revenues. So I zoomed through that. Um, sorry, but wanted to make sure I met the timeline. Do you guys have any questions? This is a general question, not really for you, but for Brian. If we can look at um, the personnel on the general fund side, because you know there's a lot of personnel requests on that side, kind of like what he did, to look at the benefits of um, the personnel request to see um, the reason that they, they, they are asking for the personnel and if it can be ranked high, medium, or low, that mm -hmm. will kind of give us a better gauge in how to fund those personnel positions on the general fund side. We can do that. Anything else? Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. you, Rob. Thank, Thank you. Next up, we'll have Russ with Water Resources.
Okay. Uh, Mayor and Council members, thanks for the opportunity uh, this afternoon to uh, share some Water Resource Department uh, budget. And um, we're also going to cover rates and a brief update on sewer capacity. So we'll cover three topics today. Um, starting out with budget, I'm going to just focus on our, our changes to our base budget, which are primarily focused on infrastructure renewal and vehicle replacements, and then talk about personnel and then the CIP program. So to start with the base budget, really there's two uh, big ticket items for us. Our infrastructure renewal program, which is our horizontal assets, water and sewer mains that are um, buried throughout the city. We have set a, a replacement goal of 1% of that piping network per year for both water and sewer. <clears throat> That assumes when you say a pipe is going to, uh, you're going to replace 1% a year, each pipe has to last 100 years. And with modern materials, we think that's feasible. Um, <clears throat> our current funding level uh, is $1.4 million per year. We've actually had a program to raise that every year for the last uh, seven, eight years. So again, this year we are uh, recommending a, a $100,000 increase that will be split across both our construction and maintenance divisions. They both do this infrastructure renewal. Uh, so that's one of our big base budget items. <clears throat> then moving to um, vehicle and equipment replacements, I just summarized the total for all five divisions. Uh, really all the um, vehicles that we're replacing are supported by the garage. We work with the garage. We don't even put them in the CIP unless the garage believes their useful life is reaching its end. So combined across those divisions, uh, just under a half a million dollars to replace those uh, pieces of equipment. There are a few items at the water treatment plant and waste plant that fall into the equipment replacement, but uh, not, not a, a large dollar amount there. And uh, of course, the uh, city manager asked us to kind of present what's interesting about this, what are the risks, and we're very similar to the um, uh, energy service utility. We've got regulatory compliance uh, uh, requirements, legal requirements. We want to make sure we avoid failures uh, in compliance. Uh, we also don't want a delay in customer service or emergency response. So these infrastructure renewals and uh, vehicle and equipment replacements support those goals. And then ultimately infrastructure failure and loss of service. If we don't take care of this piping network as it ages, then we're going to be uh, prone to more failures. Um, to support this concept of trying to reach the 1% goal, we've been working at this for a few years. This, this graphic is our water main infrastructure replacement program. That uh, upper line, the green horizontal line, is the 1% goal. It's right around 15,000 feet a year. And you can tell we've struggled to uh, reach that goal, but we're close on a few years. Um, we'll talk about some personnel additions here in a second that can support this. but. This says we do need to spend more each year on that infrastructure renewal, and that, that supports the request for the $100,000 increase. On the, um, the sewer infrastructure renewal, we've done a little bit better. We, uh, the goal is the orange bar across the top. We've uh, met that and exceeded it um, at least one year, and we're very close in a couple other fiscal years. So again, with the extra $100,000, we'll continue to push up and reach that 1% goal, and that'll make the uh, long-term sustainability um, for the city's water and sewer infrastructure. So um, switching to personnel under the budget topic, uh, we are requesting uh, two positions, only two positions. I feel a little overwhelmed by Rob's uh, position count, but understand. But uh, So uh, we strategically look at positions. We have uh, one of the things we've really focused on over the years, just staying lean and mean. What's the minimum we need to do to get the job done? Um, in our um, um, uh, maintenance division, uh, we have not added staff since 2005. We've added a lot of work, a lot of programs, but we found ways to cross-train and repurpose staff. And so uh, we are uh, recommending adding uh, two entry-level positions. There'll be equipment operator one positions in this maintenance division. The drivers, of course, are to reach that infrastructure replacement goal. So we can sustain that at a 1% level. But we're also seeing um, account growth, just as uh, Rob mentioned, uh, with new customer growth. That means more work orders, more meters to be set, more maintenance. So we do need to be able to respond to that. And uh, with, there's a few other important needs that are not quite being met. Our smoke testing program, which finds sewer defects, we're not quite reaching our goals there, and also our valve 
uh, exercise program. So these two staff will help us meet all of those goals, hopefully. Um, the consequences and risks are the same as, as what I outlined under the um, base budget slide. We really just need to make sure we're staying in regulatory compliance, providing good uh, customer service and emergency response, and then keeping our infrastructure in good shape. Uh, because these two positions will be integrated into existing crews, there's really no equipment costs. The uh, supplies costs will be minimal, uh, but the salaries for both positions combined would be 124000 and some change. And then, of course, going forward, the recurring costs would just be those uh, salary benefit costs plus any merit and, and COLA. So. Last item under uh, budget is our proposed fiscal 23 uh, capital improvement. These are new initiatives, uh, not, not the replacements. Those were already covered. Um, what you'll see, uh, a couple items have that uh, entry out uh, to the right of the dollar amount. The risk and resilience study, that's the study we brought city council that you uh, had to approve by law, was a, a federal requirement, with, had some state elements too. Uh, so I'll cover those two first. Uh, we are proposing a new uh, 500 kW generator for the water treatment plant, uh, $250,000. Uh, that will provide actually a hot standby to our existing generator. So if we have um, uh, multiple failures, we can keep the critical parts of the uh, water plant running. Um, and then jumping down to the replacement of the Nelson Heights water tank, that was also identified in the risk study as, a, as an, need, an immediate need for a couple reasons. As the demand for water grows, we have to have more stored water. The Nelson Heights tank is currently a half a million gallons per day, so 0.5 million. We are proposing a new tank that will um, uh, be a 1.5 million gallon per day tank, so it solves two problems. The Nelson Heights tank is our oldest tank. It's a riveted steel tank. It's got lead paint on it. It's been overcoated a couple times. Uh, it's time to replace it and at the same time uh, upsize uh, to meet future demands. So uh, those are two uh, projects that you've seen before as part of that risk and resilience study. And then jumping back to the uh, top, we do have two DOT projects that keep going hot and cold. We don't know when they're going to go. DOT is saying they could go again in the, the near future. Um, in those cases, uh, DOT will pay 75% of the utility relocation costs. Our costs will be 25%. So the um, two amounts uh, you see there are the city's 25% uh, share. Um, then uh, moving down the, the line, um, you may recall uh, we brought City Council a water treatment plant basin uh, contract award uh, six months ago. That was for basin number one. It was about $610,000. We do need to move to basin two and do it in fiscal 23. So we're forecasting uh, with material cost increases uh, $700,000 to do that uh, basin coating. Uh, and then we have um, a couple of other large projects, the um, UIT, that stands for Unionville Indian Trail. We have a uh, sewer pump station that's being rebuilt by developers as part of the Riverstone subdivision. They're paying probably over $2 million in developer-funded uh, improvements for that pump station, but downstream of that, there is a needed upgrade on the city's piping, the sewer force main that'll safely deliver that uh, wastewater sewer to our treatment plant, so um, that's been in our CIP, and so we are uh, recommending that that be funded in fiscal 23. And the last one at the bottom, the very important, uh, we are recommending beginning in July, starting the process of designing and permitting our wastewater plant uh, expansion. Uh, the $4 million is based on 8% of the construction costs. The construction is going to be around $50 million, it's kind of our current uh, uh, projection. We are finishing a, a, a big engineering study on that now. We'll be sharing that with council. That's also related to the uh, potential partnerships we're doing with Union County, and we have a meeting, a group meeting tomorrow uh, with them. So uh, it's a three year process just to complete that design and the permitting. There's a lot to that uh, environmental permitting and the design work. That takes us out to about fiscal 26. The construction is also three years. So if we start in July, then we can be bringing a new wastewater plant capacity online in fiscal 29. It's a six-year process. You can't build these things overnight. You can't design them and permit them and construct. So um, 
based on the growth that we're having, and we're going to cover the capacity at the end of the program here, uh, it is time to begin that process. And uh, So this has been in the CIP for a number of years. It's finally come to the fruition and, and ready, ready to go. Uh, the great thing about this $10.2 million, uh, we're proposing to fund this completely out of undesignated cash and our capital reserve fund. Uh, we'll be covering rates next, but we've been working with our finance department over the years. It's very positive to be able to fund this level of capital improvements with cash. Uh, it avoids revenue bonds and, and the extra costs that are involved there, so there's no debt involved in this. This will be 100% cash funded. So any questions about the budget before I move into rates? And the Nelson Heights Tower is the one that you can see. Yes, sir. Yeah. And what would you do with the old one? So there will have to be a preliminary engineering study. If the new one can go on the site, the old one will be torn down, because ultimately it will need to be torn down. It has lead paint, and it can't just sit there. Um, it's interesting, like in Waxhaw, some places they, they keep those tanks as kind of a community marker. It's an option, but then you have to maintain that structure and keep it painted and everything else. There's cost to that. So um, most likely it would be removed, and then based on soil conditions, the new tank would either be at that site or we have a couple other options for sites that we've already identified. So uh, that will all be figured out with a preliminary engineering report brought to city council with a site strategy, and then you'll be uh, council will be involved in making that decision. Those old ones got salvage value? Um, the steel probably has some salvage value. That would be included in the bid for the removal. The demo contractor would get to keep, <laughs> you know, get to dispose of, and if they can salvage it and get, you know, $50,000, then that would be uh, re probably reduce the price a little bit. So, okay. So um, let's talk about water and sewer rates. Uh, put a little prop at your... Uh, at your uh, seat today. Uh, this is for you to use as you get questions from your constituents and our citizens about our rates and the value of water. So I have one question for you before we start. Pretty straightforward. How many times can you fill this 16-inch sports bottle out of your Monroe tap for one dollar today? 600. Okay, I like that. A man who's confident in his, a mayor who's confident in his, uh, I know we've got some educators in here, we've got business people, certainly. Any other guesses? 600. That's a good starting point. 750. 17 times? 750. 750. See, he's strategically just a little above you there, Mayor, just trying to. 751. <laughs> no, you, get, you only get one shot, Mayor. I'm sorry. I got to just kind of live with this. Thing. It's a lot cheaper than you could buy that in a grocery store. 825. That, see, who, he who waits till the end and gets that last year, you, you're on the right track. The price is right. Okay, anybody else? Thousand. So, the, I'll put a thousand. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Miss Thompson waited until last, so she usually I don't put a dollar on y'all's bottle. I only put it on this one, and then the closest one gets the bottle. But today, and I do want you to know, these are my dollars out of my wallet. No public <laughs> funds are being given to you. We're not expending public funds for this um, this uh, proposed promotional item. So, okay. So the answer is two thousand seven hundred and forty. Two thousand seven. That's what I, I, I was reading that, but Miss Thompson, you're the winner. Congratulations. I'm just going by the you get to keep one your dollar bill. Yeah, you, you get to keep, keep your dollar. Oh, wait, everybody bottle. else does too. <laughs> and we do that because we do this at community events and stuff, you know, question uh, people. They're blown away. Uh, where can you get 2,740 of anything for a dollar, number one? By the way, you die without water in about seven days. That's what happens to the human body. So, you know, it just, it points out, it's one of the last true values out there. It, you know, tap water delivered straight to your house. People don't always like the taste, but it is safe. We do a, a, a lot of work, a lot of samples, a lot of testing to make sure. So, uh, as your question about rates and what we do, you can share that with your constituents as you feel well. And, and the bottle and dollar of yours to keep. Sorry, Brian and Mujib only had $8. So. It's more regulated than the bottle water you buy in the store. It, and I'm I, just thinking your marketing slogan of great value and you don't die probably can do some work. 
<laughs> I'm going to leave that up to you guys of how you use that. So, Okay, so just jumping into it, every year we participate with the North Carolina League of Municipalities uh, rate benchmarking survey. So this year there were 400, or 2021, there were 485 utilities. So for a typical residential customer, that means a customer using about 5,000 gallons a month, um, we compare very favorably. Uh, we're 76th lowest out of 485 utilities, so that put us in about the 16th percentile. And on the sewer side, uh, 102nd lowest out of 411, not all the utilities do sewer. So again, we're in the bottom 25th percentile, so very, very, very good um, for our customers in Monroe. And, and really, I want to compliment um, past city councils, which includes some of you, for our strategy to do uh, uniform re annual rate increases for the past 10 years. We have raised rates every year but one. But those rate increases have been more in the 3% range. And what we've done is raise those rates annually to meet not just current needs, but also future needs. And so that we're going to show you our, our um, undesignated cash balance right now. We have grown that significantly in the last 10 years, anticipating $50 million wastewater plant projects and things of that nature. So a uh, great compliment to past councils and those of you who have been involved in that because it's let us um, you know, grow our uh, reserves and uh, kind of avoid the what we call rate shock and industry impacts when you do a 15 or 20% in a year. Nobody likes that. Uh, if, we, if we are smart with our money and do the 3% uh, plus or minus, then um, we, we can fund a lot of things with cash and it really saves us a lot of money long term. So uh, at the end of uh, fiscal 22, we're, we're uh, forecasting we'll have about $41.6 million available. And that's a combination of our undesignated cash and also our reserve funds. Uh, this so allows us to support a CIP and expensive capital projects without going out to the revenue bond market. How, for the large wastewater plant project, we will do a 60% revenue bond, 40% cash as our current strategy. So we do have a recommendation this year. It's actually uh, the same as last year. Uh, we do a 15-year projection to get this rate. We don't just do one year at a time, so we are looking out multiple years. We feel it's prudent at this time with all the um, capital expenses coming up to uh, recommend a 3.5 uh, rate increase for both water and sewer. What this means for a typical residential uh, customer's bill, uh, 94 cents a month for the water side and $1.34 per month on the uh, waste sewer side. We do, um, as this goes through council process, if you support this and we are preparing to raise rates, uh, we work with Ron Mail with the Economic Development Group, and we do um, uh, direct contact with our top 10 customers, tell them what's going on. We've done that for five, six, seven years in a row. They're very supportive of this lower regular rate increases instead of waiting. So we've got good support from the Tyson Foods, Allback, uh, Charlotte Plastics, um, others, Hospital. Those are all in our top 10. And then we do uh, recommend a uh, Consumer Price Index, CPI, we use a 10-year average. That average is up a little bit this year because this year is a 6 or 7% uh, inflation. But uh, for the non-construction costs, we were recommending a 2.32% increase. And then our construction-related fees, which would be capacity fees and tap fees, uh, the construction cost index 10-year average is currently 2.68. So those are our recommendations. Very, very similar to last year. Okay, any questions about rates before I move on? Okay, last item. Um, last uh, time we gave City Council a wastewater capacity update was February of 21. So uh, we committed at that time to come every year and give you an update. <clears throat> so I'll go through this quickly. Um, our treatment plant is currently rated at 10.4 million gallons per day. Uh, we have seen a pretty significant drop in the average day flow because we had a severe drought this year. We had some very dry months. You've got to understand that a wastewater plant, all wastewater plants in the entire United States have a fairly major element of groundwater and rainwater that just gets in the, the piping network. It's, it's called inflow and infiltration. We, we do a lot to keep it out, but it is a, a fact of life. Um, last year when we were presented, 
our average day flow was uh, almost a million gallons per day higher. So what that means is um, we, uh, so projecting how we can use this available capacity, we do have our contract with Union County. They have about a half a million gallons per day unused. We do need to maintain a wet weather contingency because if it turns wet again, those flows will go up and we can't have a compliance violation because of that. So we're very cautious with that. The on paper commitments that um, we have made due to the growth, but the actual ones have been committed for water and sewer uh, permits are around uh, 800,000 gallons per day. What that means is we have 1.9 million left for uh, zoning commitments that are coming uh, that'll turn into water and sewer permits and then also non-residential economic development uh, projects. So again, um, our planned wastewater plan expansion won't be online until fiscal 29, so we've got to use that 1.9 million wisely up to that period. Uh, and of course, all those things are decided by city council. And so here's what we gave you um, last February, February 21, so a year ago. Uh, what we're calling it is a capacity use strategy. Um, and really what it amounts to is water resources coordinates uh, very carefully with planning and economic development to look at maximizing our property tax uh, additions and our utility revenue growth, balancing residential and commercial industrial projects that can be attracted and brought to city council. And then on the residential side, hopefully what that turns into is you know new annexations that are quality, uh, of course, um, all approved by city council. We got to meet our on paper commitments. We're forecasting a little more conservatively than energy services. Um, there's a number of reasons. Um, our average uh, meter sets per year have been more in the 200, 250 range. Uh, this year might be a, a 400, a 375 or 400. We don't see those going to 1,000 or 1,100 that was presented earlier, but you know that's just a function of the economy. We think what's going to happen as, and I've talked to a number of developers and economic development folks, as we have more product to offer across the city, there's only so many buyers. Now we've had a lot of buyers, more than we've ever seen in the history of, of Monroe, but as there's more competition for buyers, the number of sales per subdivision will be slightly lower. That doesn't mean that we're not still having positive, great growth. We're just not sure every subdivision can sustain the 50 or 75 sales per year once there's 10 and 15 competing. Historically, we've had more of three or four going at the same time, and so that has driven for us, for water, and I understand energy does serve some areas outside of the city, but for us, we're forecasting closer to 500 uh, per year, which is still an incredible revenue growth, tax base growth. Um, so if it goes higher than that, we're prepared to adjust and, and, and work with that. But we think we're going to be a little more conservative because that drives that uh, revenue forecast, our rate recommendation. If all of a sudden we start setting 1,000 meters per year, fantastic. The revenue will be stronger than we think. We might be able to adjust the rates in fiscal 24 or 25 because we do it the, that multi-year approach. So we're a little more conservative on the growth. Um, so what that means, we would need to um, uh, use approximately 1.1 million gallons per day over the seven years leading up to the wastewater plant. If it does turn into a thousand a year, we'll use some of that wet weather contingency. There's some other things we can do with the NCDEQ in the, what's called a planning assessment. So um, if it turns into a thousand, we'll adjust, but we think it might be a little bit lower than that. And I'd be, I'd love to hear input from council what they think when you have all these different offerings and what does that mean for the buyers? And because uh, buyers are really a function of the economy and the, uh, uh, yeah, the interest in Monroe. And then uh, working with uh, economic development, we're, um, we have a pretty significant capacity available, breaking it down almost on an annual basis. It's uh, 115,000 gallons per day each year for the next seven years. We can attract some major new industries, uh, commercial, restaurants, motels, combination thereof. Um, so um, you know, Chris and Ron are excited to have this to work with because kind of in the county and other areas, they don't uh, have anything to offer at this time. So, so that is our capacity use. Uh, just close by saying uh, from water resource perspective, it's extremely positive time for the city. 
uh, the, the, both the residential, commercial, industrial growth has just brought um, a lot of good tax base, and I just want to uh, really compliment the council for working with us on a proactive utility plan that puts us in a position. We've got cash, we've got capacity, and we've got plans uh, for expansion so we can continue to grow Monroe, and I think it's a very exciting time. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any other questions. Russ, we certainly thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a story we like to hear. <laughs> and we'll Unlike be, our neighbors. We'll be seeing some of you tomorrow at 4 p.m., and I'll look forward to that. So thanks again. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I am Ashley Ivey. I'm here to present the budget items for the Legislative Department. It's a major now. Right. Mine is much less exciting than Rob and Russ's. So. <laughs> um, the items that I'm Numbers presenting... Numbers are a lot smaller, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm presenting informational items. These items are included in the budget each year. Um, because they've already been adopted with council policies that have been adopted, but it's just information for you all to know what is included. Um, in the city council discretionary budget, each year um, discretionary funds are allotted to the mayor, mayor pro tem, and each individual council member um, at $3,000 per fiscal year. Um, this is um, spelled out in the city council discretionary funds and purchasing policy. Um, this council travel budget is also adopted in the travel policy for the elected officials and each member of council um, is allotted $5,000 per fiscal year for travel. Um, this is for conferences, other educational um, <clears throat> needs. Um, within this policy, uh, no transfers are permitted to change this allocation unless approved by you all. Um, this includes between council members and from their discretionary funds. For example, if you have excess funds in your travel budget and you'd like to use them for discretionary, that cannot be interchangeable. That was changed a few years back. Um, so you've got the $3,000 for discretionary and $5,000 for travel each year. Um, the Youth Council budget, that is currently budgeted at $42,000 per year. Um, this includes expenses for two trips and other meeting and event expenses um, throughout each fiscal year for the folks on that um, Youth Council. Um, city Council wages, those are based on a specified percentage amount of the median family income. Uh, median family income is prepared by the U.S. Census Bureau, um, and Council's pay is adjusted annually, and it's linked to this index. Um, the percentage can vary depending on the position. For example, it's higher, highest for the mayor, followed by mayor pro tem, and then by a council member. Um, this is self-adjusted annually with changes to the median family income as long as that index increases. Um, so the estimated cost, you can see um, there we've got the estimated wages for this current fiscal year and this upcoming fiscal year 23. So annualized, um, they're estimating a wage increase of $770 total for all of council. Um, the next item are some monthly stipends. These are also included in the city council um, discretionary fund and purchasing policy. Um, the mayor and mayor pro tem receive monthly a cell phone allowance of $125 and each other individual council member receives 100. Um, the health insurance benefits, that's not a stipend, but um, if you opt for the health insurance coverage, um, that benefit is equal to that of a full-time city employee um, that you can elect employee only coverage or employee spouse, the benefit differs depending on the benefit. Um, the internet stipend, um, each of you, mayor, mayor pro tem, and each council member receive a $45 a month internet stipend. Um, office expense stipend is monthly as well, $50 for each. And then travel, um, this is within the county, separate from the $5,000 travel allotment you get for outside of Union County. Um, the mayor receives $400 a month, mayor pro tem $350 a month, and each other council member $300 a month. That's all I have, if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Any questions? Mayor, I'll let you. Thank you very much. Thank you, each one of you, for your presentations. 
Uh, any other comments or questions, uh, Council, at this time? If not, uh, I call for a recess of the meeting and we'll reconvene at uh, 6 p.m. Okay.